Yeah, good morning. Can I uh, welcome members of the press and public to the seventh meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, I would like to ask all those present to ensure that their electronic items are switched uh, to flight mode uh, so, that the, so that they do not affect the work of the committee. Uh, colleagues, can I refer you to agenda item number one, which is a decision to take business in private. Uh, the question is that we take agenda items number five and six in private. Is it agreed? Yeah. Colleagues, can I take you to agenda item number two, uh, which is headed the Accounts Commission Borrowing and Treasury Management and Councils. Uh, I'd like to welcome Graham Sharp uh, and Pauline Wheatman from the Accounts Commission. Uh, Fraser McKinley, uh, Director and Controller of Audit and Audit Scotland. Uh, Gemma Diamond, the Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. Uh, I understand that the Accounts Commission would like to make a brief opening statement. Good convener and good morning to everyone. Convener, the report we are here to discuss today on behalf of the Accounts Commission looked at borrowing and treasury management in councils. Borrowing is a major source of funding for councils to invest in infrastructure such as schools and roads, essential for the provision of key public services. At the same time, in today's environment, councils have ongoing challenges of reducing public spending. The report looks at how councils are demonstrating affordability in making decisions to borrow. It looks at the different positions that councils are in as a result of historical borrowing and policy decisions. This report focused on long-term borrowing. We did not evaluate day-to-day cash investment and borrowing transactions, or look at other forms of debt, including public-private partnerships. The report is aimed at councillors as the key audience and considers the clarity and purpose of Treasury management reports presented to them, which are often very technical in nature. It considers the skills and expertise that councillors need to perform their key scrutiny role. During 2014, we looked at Treasury management reports relating to 12 councils to get an indication of the clarity, content and variation of financial policy among councils. We interviewed officers and councillors from six of the 12 councils to get a more detailed insight. The report provides a summary of the main themes and conclusions arising from this work and identifies what more needs to be done. The messages and recommendations in the report apply to all councils and our expectation is that financial officers along with councillors will review the report, assess themselves against it and implement the relevant recommendations. If I now turn to what we found, borrowing by Scottish councils is £12.1 billion, around 82% of councils total debt. Councils take on this debt to invest in capital assets such as schools and roads. As I have noted, our focus for this audit was on the borrowing element. We looked at Council's borrowing since the introduction of the Prudential Code 10 years ago. The Prudential Code is a framework to support Councils and help them show effective control over levels of and decisions relating to capital investment activity, including borrowing. We found that just over half of councils have higher levels of borrowing now than 10 years ago. Councils are following relevant codes and regulations and they are clearly demonstrating short-term affordability of borrowing and other debt. But we have found it difficult to identify how they analyse long-term affordability and communicate this to councillors through strategies and reports for council. For example, Councils have information on capital investment requirements for up to 10 years, on the timing and cost of repaying borrowing, and forecasts for future interest rates. But there was no analysis bringing this together with budget scenarios to assess the affordability in the longer term. Treasury management is a professionally run function in Councils. There are signs of more joint working and integration of activity with the capital investment function, which is a positive step. We do see potential issues in the future around the transfer and succession of skills and experience in this area, and suggest that councils may wish to plan for this together. 
Councils have a range of governance and scrutiny arrangements, which is fine. The detailed arrangements are not for us to prescribe but these need to be consistent across each council, enabling councillors to build up knowledge and experience in this technical area. We think councillors need to ask and be equipped to ask more questions of officers around the affordability of borrowing and other financing options, particularly in the longer term, and about performance based on prudential and other indicators as reflected in year-end reports. We think reports for councillors could be improved. They can be very technical documents and they should be written with councillors and the general public in mind. If I may now quickly summarise our recommendations. The report makes recommendations aimed at helping councils develop treasury management strategies to present a wider, more integrated strategic view of borrowing and treasury management encourage them to be more open about and report on longer term affordability and help councillors scrutinise treasury management activity. The main recommendations are first for councils to prepare the tre treasury management strategy with councillors as the key audience and present a wider strategic view of borrowing and treasury management. It should include how the borrowing strategy is informed by corporate priorities and capital investment needs. Secondly, councils need to create more detailed and longer term borrowing and treasury management analysis as informed by the council's financial strategy. It should include scenario planning, the analysis of capital financing options and the use of prudential indicators over a longer period than the minimum three years requirement contained in the Prudential Code. Year-end reports should provide an overall assessment of performance and Treasury activity. Finally, councillors and officers should review governance arrangements to ensure they provide councillors with a wider strategic view of borrowing and Treasury management and that councillors have access to all relevant Treasury management reports. They should also ensure that training for councillors provides the appropriate level and balance of Treasury management knowledge and of scrutiny skills. We have provided a short guide and scrutiny <coughs> questions for councillors to assist this process, and this is published separately from the report. Convener, my colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have on the report. Okay, <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Sharp. Can I, can I first of all uh, start the questions by asking the, referring the panel to page 31 uh, of the report uh, and paragraph 56, where it's uh, was reference to the statement: council governance structures are in place, but not all meet code requirements. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate. Uh, on that particular reference? Certainly. What we found was that they were all generally following the principles of the code, but in sometimes the, um, the requirement for everything to go to be approved by full council wasn't um, always being done, that it might be doing by the full council approving the minutes of another meeting where that had been approved. So the actual treasure management strategy wasn't itself going to um, full committee to be approved. Did you elaborate on the number of councils that uh, you found in that position? I think there was two of the six that we looked at. Okay. So it could, in terms of the, the assessment that was carried out, it was only six councils? Yes, so that's right. We looked at six so, in detail. Uh, so in terms of percentage terms, then it could be even higher than... The, we don't the have the evidence have. On, on the other councils, so I wouldn't be able to comment on, on, on what Is that not the something that be. should have been pursued in terms of ensuring that that particular area of the code was pursued to ensure that the requirements have been met? The councils all consider that they're meeting the general spirit of the requirements of, of the code in that um, the full committee would have the opportunity to see the, tr the strategy and are approving the minutes of the committee where that strategy has been approved. And certainly the strategy is available to all, um, to all members but it's just not following the exact requirements of the code that the full committee approves that Treasury management strategy. Okay. If it would be helpful, can we, can we can see if we can find out, um, as, as Gemma says, in terms of 
um, our, our approach to the work as we do often we took a sample um, and uh, but if it'd be helpful for the committee we can certainly see if we can find that specific bit of information across all 32. Mm -hmm. I mean correct me for a moment but in terms of the opening statement uh, from Mr Sharp you referred to that the councils were meeting the requirements of them and I'm sure you referred to, to code the practice as well is that accept this paragraph? I think the, in, the, in the opening statement, we're saying that in material terms, they're meeting the code. And, and I think the, the more significant point from, from our point of view, I think, is that we believe the code doesn't go far enough in a number of respects, particularly as regards the maturity of borrowing and, and looking far enough into the future. And that's the point I think we're trying to get ac across there. Okay. Ms. Gallant? Thank you. Um, throughout the, the report, you often mention, well, in fact, it's uh, page five, but uh, overall borrowing remains around 12 billion uh, for the last three years in assets of 39. That's mentioned quite often. Does that mean that you're quite content of uh, <coughs> a level of borrowing about a third uh, of the level of assets or... You know, as, as a member of this committee, at what point should we be concerned at the level of borrowing uh, in relation to assets? I, th I think there are a couple of um, levels one uh, needs to deal with uh, that question. F first of all, these are total figures. And personally, I wouldn't be content or discontent on the basis of the aggregated figures. I think what, what matters is looking at specific councils and their financial plans and strategies and how they justify the borrowing and other debt they've taken on in terms of its sustainability looking forward. And one, one doesn't uh, capture that in, in aggregated figures. And, and secondly, we, we've put in the, the asset figure to, to give a feeling for scale. Um, be, because borrowings are serviced and repaid from future revenues. So one really needs to look at the future projections. It's, it's not quite the same situation as, as you get in companies where you can have asset cover for properties that are realizable in, in, in the market, for example. Uh, clearly, the assets councils have, uh, are to a large extent, infrastructure assets and they're there to provide services rather than generate an economic rent. Um, so, so it's a case of looking at individual councils and um, what their plans are. So it's just that you do, I'm an economist, not an accountant, but uh, you do constantly mention 12 billion and 39 billion assets in the way I'm reading it. It's like there's a bit of comfort here. We don't need to worry. We've only got 12.8 billion uh, borrowing. So, it, you know, are the asset, I mean, if it was uh, 30 billion borrowing, or if it was 38 billion borrowing uh, against 39 billion assets, would that not be a cause for concern? You would simply be looking at individual councils and how they... Well, as I say, I would assess it in terms of the okay. individual councils and their specific financial plans and borrowings, and not on the basis of aggregated figures. I mean, I, I don't know if... No, I think, uh, the thing is, Mrs. I don't suppose... The, the, using those numbers, Mrs. Scanlon, is designed to give comfort, or otherwise, it is, as, as Graham said, just designed to give a sense of of scale. And similarly to some of the conversations we've had with the committee in the past around levels of reserves, I don't think it's it's right for us, or the Accounts Commission, to come up with a magic number about what's what's good or bad, or or worrying or not worrying. I think, as as uh, Graham has has explained, what's important, and this is why we make this point strongly in the report. What's important is that levels of borrowing need to be understood in the context of a council's long-term financial plans, and that's the bit that we think could be strengthened. OK, if I can just go on to my second question, convener, and it is the, about the financial plans of individual councils, page 13, Exhibit 4. Uh, I notice that East Lothian and West Lothian have uh, pretty well, you know, just looking at the histogram here, uh, probably more than doubled their borrowing in the last 10 years. We've also got significant increases from uh, in Edinburgh and South Lanarkshire. Uh, are there any specific reasons why these four councils have had a drastic increase? Uh, for the rest of the councils, there's been very little decrease, as you said, Mr Sharp. But is there any particular reason why these four councils 
have had a fairly dramatic increase in uh, borrowing. So, so I'll I'll kick off, um, uh, Mr. Scanlon, and yeah. if we don't have if we don't have the detail yeah, on that, very happy to come back to you with the detail on those things because, as you say, the numbers are striking. I know from other audit work we've done, the City of Edinburgh is the trams. Um, so there was a very specific reason for uh, the increase in borrowing there. Um, and similarly, I think in East Lothian and West Lothian, there were reasons. Gemma, can you help us with that? Um, so the detail on all of it, but um, essentially it really depends on what their asset management plan and their capital investment plan has been over that period. And what I think this exhibit shows is that they have had all <coughs> di quite different plans over that period. So West Lothian has... Um, had significant investment in its assets over that period and has used borrowing as a means of, of funding that investment. Can I start by asking a very basic question? Who is ultimately responsible for borrowing by the councils? Well, themselves, that's legally responsible for the borrowing. So the councils are responsible for the borrowing, not the government? Correct, yes. So they're completely independent? They are. Thank you. Um, on paragraph 16, it states that uh, 17 of 32 councils increased their borrowing, and yet, paragraph 18, it says fewer councils are borrowing now than 10 years ago. And, of course, if you look at the level of debt, it seems to be bouncing along within the same sort of, uh, same sort of margins. But we just heard from what Mary Scanlon was saying, that some councils have substantially increased their borrowing. Presumably, then, we've got councils that are decreasing their borrowing. Yes, I mean, you can see from the histogram that there are some councils that have reduced, and I think there's a, an issue about timescales on, on the two paragraphs that Gemma may be able to, to expand on. Um, but clearly, each and, and this is one of the reasons you need to look at it on a council by council basis. Each council is in a different position in terms of looking at the future requirement for services and what that means about in, infrastructure investment. They have um, they're in a different position in terms of the condition of their existing estate, and they're in a different position as regards the, 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 their financial options in terms of what. Uh, revenues they, they may look to in the future, whether they have any um, particular uh, sources of revenue that might be specific to them, which is the case in some councils. So all of those things go together uh, in, in terms of cycle and, and um, the absolute position to determine what is reasonable. And that's why you see different patterns in different councils as well as different levels. I, I don't know, Gemma, if you want to add to that or not. Which I think is what takes us to paragraph 27, which says about the differences at a local level. And it's, you're saying here that the differences are likely to increase over time as council's choices reflect local priorities. Can you maybe expand a bit on that? I, th I think what we've found since the Prudential Code was increased is that there has been um, a level of variability in what councils have, have chosen to do and how they've chosen to fund their, their investment in, in their assets. And what we can see is that that variation will continue. We saw that councils have um, very different strategies in terms of whether they are going to borrow or not going to borrow. We've seen now new um, debt models that are starting to be used. For example, the, the tax incremental financing and the growth accelerator model and city deals, which are now councils are starting to look into as ways of investing in their assets so that we can see that this um, variation is something that will continue over time. I, I, I mean, I would add that this, this, is, this particular report is about the borrowing element. So as um, non-borrowing options may increase in future and may be used more in future, differences in the borrowing levels will follow. Can I ask about... Uh, I think an, an important aspect of this is also about the quality of the borrowing that councils are making. There's an assumption, I think, that it's all uh, PWB borrowing. But I know that councils, for example, have Bermudan interest rate swaps and such like, which are rather more exotic and carry higher risks in terms of the councils. Um, there's no mention of this in the report. 
What we found at the moment is that councils are largely borrowing from PWLB as that offers the best interest rates at the moment. We know that historically councils have used other um, borrowing options, but that at the moment it's PWLB borrowing. And last question was that uh, short-term borrowing you're saying is increasing, which is, a bit, which is a bit of a concern if it's not linked to longer-term planning. In principle, I, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, if, if you look at the figures, one effect of the increase in, in short-term borrowing has actually been to rather even out the maturities, which is in principle a good thing. Um, but it's, it's been driven uh, over the last few years, I think, by the interest rates available, particularly from PWLB. Are there indications that they're borrowing, borrowing short and uh, borrowing uh, short term and uh, also lending out onto the market to make a turn? I'm not aware we've come across that, but um, I'll... No, no I, I have heard it's been happening. Thank you. Um, some related questions um, around the role of councillors, uh, which is a, a major focus of your report. Um, could you maybe just indicate that, uh, in terms of the balance of this, uh, whether your concerns are around uh, all councillors, um, or particularly the uh, councillors who are involved in executive decision making or have a scrutiny function, uh, particular to this within the council? Um, and also, maybe if you, if you could indicate, if, in terms of your concern or interest in this, whether that's primarily, uh, and I suspect it's both, but uh, around um, decision making over borrowing or around scrutiny of um, the account. Um, I'll, I'll make a general comment and then ask others to, to come in. Um, I, I think, in general terms, um, compared to, say, um, 10 years ago or six years ago, um, f finance can't be put in a, a sort of separate box and we can get on with the business of the council and, and the financing issues can be dealt with, with separately. I think because of the economic conditions uh, everyone faces, and particularly the, the public sector, um, the assessment of um, borrowing sustainability, debt sustainability and financial decisions in general have to be much more integrated with <coughs> strategy in, in providing services, particularly future services. So to that extent, I think all councillors need to be aware much more perhaps than, than years ago of the financial position and, and the issues that that, that raises. But um, yes, if, if we look at our scrutiny guidance, we've provided guidance questions, which we believe all councillors are capable of asking. And we're trying to encourage councillors not to be afraid of the terminology and the jargon, and to have very straightforward questions which they can ask on a scrutiny basis. Why are we borrowing? Are we getting the best deal? How long will it take to repay? And what are the implications for our future revenue streams if we commit these to interest payments and repayment of borrowing? Those are questions that any councillor should have the confidence to understand. And we're saying to them, don't be afraid to ask these questions. They are legitimate questions in the scrutiny role or in any role as a councillor. Um, I, I suppose that may, maybe takes me on to is are, are there any examples of best practice, um, uh, you know, where the where the information is communicated clearly and, and therefore we've got a, a greater culture of, of scrutiny around it. And I suppose the other question, um, uh, which I wanted to come on to, but this perhaps takes me to it, is, is later on in the report you mention um, the use of external advisors um, around borrowing. Um, is there an issue about reports being prepared or information being prepared? externally uh, for officials um, and so perhaps then the officials maybe understand that the information that they're, that they're receiving externally um, or are the officials within the council the people who, who have uh, who are preparing those reports and might have a better idea of how to communicate it to their elected members um, again when we were looking at the, the borrowing and treasury management strategies we saw quite a lot of variation in the quality and the content of, of those strategies um, one that we found told a better story for members about why the, uh, the council was borrowing and um, explained what that meant was the um, Scottish Borders Council was one that we found told quite a nice story to, to members about um, the, the borrowing strategy. Um, 
In terms of external advisors, um, all 32 councils have um, external advisors for borrowing and treasury management advice. Um, but what we found was that the, all the officials within the um, treasury management and borrowing departments were appropriately qualified. So either financial qualifications or the treasury management qualification and were taking the advice from the advisors, but certainly writing their own reports to members. That's, that's quite reassuring because I suppose the question I, I, I wanted to ask, if I, if I can, convener, is um, around. I mean, to, to, if if an external advisor is given, and you mentioned that there's one uh, particular advisor capita, which is the the contractor for I think 28 out of 32. Um, I mean, on one level, you could understand that, that contract, someone engaged in a contract like that has a vested interest in their being borrowing amongst uh, local authorities because that's the basis of their of their contract. Um, is that is the increase in that a replacement of expertise that maybe previously existed within local authorities themselves, or is it a reflection of the fact that there is a greater um, burden on councils in terms of scrutiny and reporting and uh, of these issues, and therefore they've taken external advice? Or is it just good practice? I think all councils recognise the need for that specialist advice in this area, so from the Treasury Management Advisors who are in the market and who can give them the best advice as to what's happening in the financial markets. And certainly it's something that happened within, um, within England and Wales as well with councils taking external advice. So we would see it as um, them making sure that they have the, the best information they can to make their decisions in, in terms of getting that advice. I think if, if, if one looks at it, it's, it's a technical area and one would expect um, councils to have their own expertise within the council that understood their own financial requirements and knew what the options were for them to be met, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to um, replicate external advisors' knowledge of, of what was out there in the market. And I think what's important is that, that they represent, if you like, a smart client who's sufficiently knowledgeable to, to challenge um, external advisor's advice if it doesn't seem suitable for their circumstances. Uh, but the final question, Camino, you know, then, was just on, in the, rec the recommendations that, that you make, obviously, as the, as the Accounts Commission is, is for council officers and for, for councillors to take forward, do you have any um, general comments to, to end for me on uh, recommendations for the role of government from the point of view of the committee's interest in public sector borrowing uh, in general and as a whole? I think, um, as, as we said, the borrowing and indeed other debt issues um, are the responsibility of the individual councils and they have to be held to account for it. And, and that's done on a council by council basis through um, primarily the financial audit cycle and the risk reviews that are part of that and on individual reports as required. So. Um, I don't think there is a specific role for government in, in, in intervening in that process. And I absolutely agree with that. I suppose it's, um, and I guess we might come on to this later in the session, is you know, there are principles that are important regardless to do with transparency and long-term planning and, and ensuring that it's um, clearly reported and integrated in, in what you're actually trying to do with the money. This isn't, you know, the borrowing isn't an end in itself, let's let's remember. So, yeah, I think while we've, the Commission have, have absolutely correctly focused the recommendations on councils, I think there are principles about this that would apply to, to, to other parts of the public sector. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. I, I think uh, I follow straight from there because if I look at Exhibit 5 on, on page 15, which tells me <coughs> about maturity dates, um, which, as I think has already been commented, is, is maybe actually becoming um, less skewed, uh, which would be, in principle, a good thing. That doesn't tell me the one thing I absolutely have to know, which is what the interest rates are. Um, now, you haven't told me that, but it's not there. Who's actually auditing the results well, that would be down to the individual council audits. Um, I, I think to, to aggregate all the interest payments wouldn't be a terrible useful, ter terribly useful statistic for this particular report because one would need to look at essentially the discretionary spend available council by council that's that's available to cover that and you get into a very complex and uh, I agree. Yeah, I, I, that, that wasn't my point but I, I do take the 
you, you, you're entitled to that interpretation, <laughs> forgive me. That wasn't where I was going, but it was more a matter of you, you've told us about making sure that councillors are in a position to ask the right questions. I'm still slightly concerned as to whether they are actually capable, most councillors, and I was one, of understanding the answers, but nonetheless being able to get the right questions is a good start. But we then finish up with councils, as you've said, being responsible for what they do, and I'm really very concerned as who's going to make sure that the councils have actually got a strategy, because I think somewhere in here you talked about five to ten years as being long term. I'm afraid I don't think five to ten years is long term. I'm expecting my local council to be running in 30 years' time. And, and the fact that it's got, you know, it's got debts that will be paid in, in 30 years' time is something that somebody somewhere really should be worrying about. And if it's just the council internally, I think people are well capable of fooling themselves. So I think it, that, that's what's really mm -hmm. concerning me. Most people yes. won't, of course, but uh, that, that's my real concern is if the Accounts Commission isn't worrying about that, who really, really overall is? Well, uh, for, first of all, I think one of the main messages from the report is that we're not satisfied that, that, that councils are looking far enough into the future. I, I think the five to ten years links with the capital investment structure of, of how they how they uh, look at things. But um, Fraser, do you want? Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think those points are extremely well made. And, you know, the, the reason that the, the Commission asked us to do this piece of work is exactly because I don't think it's had an awful lot of light shone on it in, in the past, uh, certainly not since the code was brought in. And I think it is also worth saying that up until this point, councils have got a pretty decent track record of, of doing this. So it's not it's not a kind of on the critical list, if I can use that phrase. But at the same time, we say in the report that there are definitely things they can do better. The role of audit is an interesting question. Um, as ever, I think the role of the local auditors would be to, to get assurance that the council themselves are doing the things to uh, understand what interest rates they're paying over what period and what that means for um, the sustainability of finances and in particular the impact on on the uh, revenue budgets into the future. I don't think it's for audit really to make an assessment of whether they're getting, in quotes, a good deal or not, uh, or whether it's, a, a, whether it's the right kind of um, interest rate or the right kind of loan they've taken. I think that is absolutely properly a decision for, uh, for management and ultimately councils uh, and councillors. Um, but the reason that the Commission have asked us to do this um, is because we think it does require some focus um, there are, uh, and, and I think it's probably right to say that the Commission will continue to look at this area and begin to look at maybe some of the other forms of debt that we mention in this report, but we haven't looked at specifically. And so I would, I would expect this to be a bit of a stream of work um, that the Accounts Commission would ask us to do over the next few years. Could I endorse the view that you should be doing that work? Because I'm sure. thinking, if if it was a business that was doing what the local council does, then the shareholders would be at risk. But then the shareholders can worry about that. This is the public domain, this mm. is public money, and yeah. local people are effectively the shareholders, and they can't go bust. Um, now, I am very conscious that it's eight years since I was a councillor, and I think, as Mr. Chump has already said, you know, a lot's changed in those eight years, but one of the things that's changed is very low interest rates have now become the norm, which again, I suspect, means it's very easy for councils to believe they can borrow lots and not worry about it, which is why I just wanted to re-express the concern that I think if you're going to look across all those other issues, you really should be, because somebody should be looking at the end result. I mean, I, I can only um, follow up what Fraser said and, and say uh, absolutely the low interest rates um, and the ability to borrow are, are clearly concerns, although um, councils can only borrow for capital purposes, mm -hmm. they, they can't borrow for to, to supplement revenue. Um, but but it's, it is absolutely one of the reasons we, we've carried out the work and, and as Fraser indicated, we intend to look at um, uh, the more complex area of, of debt in future, where if one's looking into the future, um, I would think there's going to be more of that coming down than possibly Conventional borrowing. Okay. Supplementary from Mary Scanlon, and then I'll be bringing talking Tom about Scott. borrowing for capital, but I understand that the borrowing charges, in other words, the interest repayments, actually come from revenue expenditure. Yes. So it does the, impact on. Uh, absolutely. The, yeah. the point I was making was that the fact that, that councils can legally only borrow for capital is a constraint on their, their, their ability to, to take borrowing. They need to have a capital reason to, to do it. Constraint on yes. spending. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Can I just um, explain?
explore paragraph 38 and understand exactly what you're saying in that paragraph. Um, it stated there that um, in the sample, none of the councils presented, sorry, none of the councils presented councillors with a longer term view. Why not? Was that was nobody, none of the councils were presenting more than the minimum three years as required by the Prudential Code. The Prudential Code requires them to use Prudential indicators um, to look forward for three years and that no councils were going further than that. Um, many councils hasn't, don't have that long-term financial plan in place which would inform that the analysis that they would need to do around about affordability. Three of them? How many? Um, what we found was that the, the capital plan would go up to about three to five years, but the revenue was around about one to t two to three years. Okay, from, from across all local authorities? One, the, ones the, that, the ones that we looked at. Yeah. The ones that we looked at. I think the local government overview has a, has a figure on the number of councils that didn't have a long-term financial plan, and I can certainly get that for you. Thank you. And is that why you, that paragraph then goes on to say that there is no analysis bringing this together with budget scenarios to assess affordability? That's right. What we found was that councils will know when they need to make repayments on their borrowing, what the interest rates are, where, yeah. where those are fixed, when those will fall. But what they hadn't done was got the, the revenue line to, to be able to work out the affordability. You need the, the revenue line to, to figure out if that's affordable or not. And they didn't have that over the longer term. The revenue line is only available because of three year budgeting by the Scottish Government to local Local, to local government, right? Well, what we explore in the report is the use of kind of budget scenarios, so that kind of forecasting and to say to use of scenarios of the what if the, um, and to make some assumptions about what that revenue might be to see what the risks are to the affordability of the of the borrowing. But the, the local authorities only have certainty over three year, well, degree of certainty over three year budgeting. They know nothing beyond that, do they? Unless they're going to make <laughs> heroic assumptions about what the central government might give them. Um, can I come in there? So, uh, so we hear that a lot, Mr. Scott, from councils, and I think we uh, we buy it to an extent. Um, so, we, absolutely, they, they don't have absolute certainty or clarity beyond that period, and we think it's reasonable for them to be making some assumptions, uh, hopefully not heroic ones, but assumptions that that they need to be looking ahead. And, and I think, as the point's been made already, particularly in the context of this um, report, they are making decisions already that will have an impact well beyond that. Uh, three-year time period, so we don't think it's unreasonable to expect them to make those kinds of assumptions, which of course need to be monitored and changed and, and as you go along. So a, a long, no, I take that point. So a long-term financial plan would be what ten years, or to take Nigel Don's point, I mean, is it a five-year scenario? Is it a yeah, 10 -year I mean, scenario? In, in reports we've done in the past, we've talked about up, up to ten years. I mean, I absolutely take Nigel Don's point about in this context when you're you know investing and taking out loans that have got a fifty-year yeah. period. But I think. We're, we're, I guess, trying to try some balance between what is reasonable and practical and what, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what the kind of constraints are. So we, we tend to talk about five to ten years as being medium to long term. But it would also help them if central government was setting out a longer term strategy as well <coughs> in relation to how much they're going to fund even the totality of local government. There's an argument about the bun fight between councils, but the totality of local government, sure. because that would help them with that ten year plan. And there is an interesting debate to be had there, I think, that, that might come up in some of the later uh, sessions with the Auditor Quite. General uh, about uh, exactly that kind of longevity of view um, that, that all tiers of government can take. So, so it would be fair to say there would be a recommendation for central government there in relation to at least providing some degree of clarity, all but no central government can bind a future. So that's always the caveat all ministers use, that we can't bind the next lot. But that's doesn't half, it wouldn't half help local government if that was the case. Well, as I say, I think I think there is a debate to be had yeah, there, and okay. I'm sure that will come up this okay. afternoon. You're using very civil service language, if I may say so. Can I right. ask one other question? Um, the uh, the other point I get from the government a lot is that the hub cause and the Scottish Futures Trust do not provide the transparency of of borrowing detail that would allow elected, uh, sorry, officials to give certainty to elected members about what that means in the longer term. Do you think that's a fair concern that elected members have? Well, this report is specifically about the borrowing element of debt and does not address uh, other debt, which would include um, the, the, the various sorts of schemes you're, you're referring to. So, so I don't have the evidence to, to comment on that from this. Um, I, I can say that um, the other debt uh, schemes are clearly more complex than conventional borrowing, and therefore the requirement to provide 
good information explaining exactly what those schemes mean is even more important. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, just uh, paragraph 62, <coughs> it's uh, my, f my first question. Just it's actually for a point of clarification, first of all, if I may, uh, where you, you highlight obviously Scottish Borders Council appoints non executive members. That non executive, uh, are those councillors who are in the opposition, or is, are these individuals who are not part of the local authority? I would need to check the detail on that. I'm sorry, I don't have the detail. So, um will kick me for doing this, but I'm pretty sure it's the latter. I think when we refer to non-executive members, we mean that they are people who are not councillors. But we will confirm that for you. Right. Well, can certainly. I mean, I mean, that was my interpretation of, uh, of the particular paragraph. But uh, it struck me, therefore, that uh, I mean, if if there are individuals who are not elected, who are providing uh, advice and assistance, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, I hasten to add. Uh, but um, how is that uh, fully transparent in terms of democracy? Yes, I mean, it's a good question, and, and I should say that we know that the borders aren't the only council that do this. Quite a number of uh, councils either do or have in the past have um, uh, non-councillor members uh, from the local community sitting on their audit committee. And there is a balance to be struck. I think it's really important that people are clear that it's the councillors who are there to do the democratic scrutiny bit. Um, but we also think that it can be a good thing to have uh, a different perspective to bring in some expertise um, from the local community who can who can help with some of this? So I, I absolutely take the point that there is a balance to be struck there. But I think if it's managed carefully, I think I think it can be effective. And and I'd say decision from a governance point of view, decisions or recommendations coming from the committee uh, come from the whole committee, which will be dominated by councillors and and any non-executive members should should have been selected to serve to to basically um, inform the level of debate. At the committee, it's, uh, I mean, certainly when you do go to just to double check the point and come back to the committee, uh, can you also please um, uh, find out how the selection process um, occurred? Sure. I mean, certainly also I mean, yeah, with the committees good. in the Parliament, uh, also we do bring in uh, external advisors uh, on a regular occurrence, uh, and also there's a process that, that takes place, and external advisors do provide that additional assistance and do help committees. And I suspect that's about the same here. Happy to, yeah. Okay. yeah thank you. Uh, paragraph 71 um, highlights the <coughs> situation regarding the, the reports uh, being published uh, online uh, and also the, the, the lack of uh, clear and accessible information. Um, what, what recommendations certainly would, would, you, uh, would you provide to local authorities in terms of uh, in terms of how they actually present the information online, I mean, you do suggest obviously going to make it a bit easier to find, but uh, but would you maybe recommend they actually have a particular area um, that's easily accessible uh, for members of the public uh, to actually access? Right. I, I tried it as a member of the commission, and I couldn't find all these reports. It's really difficult. Right. So a section, where when you have a company, there is always on a company an investor section. And you know exactly you can type in investors or investor relations and you'll find that section and all this stuff that looks rather dry to some people is there available. And I would like to see all councils have a section which has this governance information and reports as a separate section. Okay. The heading. And I think that would be enormously helpful. And, and I think there is also something about maybe presenting slightly different views for different people with different interests. So there will be people who want to go and find out the issues of borrowing and treasury management from that lens. You may also want to know how your new school is being paid for. So you, you would, you know, I think there's again that kind of the, the integrated word that Graham used earlier is about councils understanding, telling the story, as Gemma was saying, about what are we borrowing these things for? Where's it coming from? How much is it costing? What's it building? And what's the longer term implication of that? So it's about absolutely making it easier to find. And it is also about the way in which the story is told about borrowing that isn't you know, quite as technical and jargony as it is at the moment. Uh, thank you. And the final question is uh, paragraph 73 uh, regarding the issue of uh, training and support to improve uh, councillors' understanding also attendance. Uh, now, I, I would imagine that after an election, uh, when there's a new intake, it would be quite a challenging task for the, uh, for the, the officers uh, to put together a training plan uh, for all, particularly the, the new intake, but certainly all the councils. Um, and also, 
people have got uh, other commitments that uh, they might not have expected to be elected as a councillor for a start. So there might be, uh, there's a, a fair amount of juggling will have to take place uh, in the short term. Um, but uh, in terms of, uh, and also the situation the same uh, with a by-election, anyone who is elected there. Um, so in, in terms of uh, kind of uh, what councillors could potentially do, if the reports, if the financial reports are simplified, first of all. Uh, and in terms of the training, uh, see, if, could the training be delivered maybe in, in smaller chunks but on a more regular basis? Would that be advantageous? I, I, I think that's um, one of the points we make in the report, that that, that, that might be helpful, to recognising the fact that it may be difficult for uh, councillors to attend a full day course at, at a particular point in time. So anything such as breaking it up or indeed um, providing online uh, materials are things that um, I, I, we're recommending should be explored. I think also on the, 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 the training side, there's been a, a recent... Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that the, com the Commission and Audit Scotland are acutely aware of the pressures on councillors. It's a big job and increasingly complex these days. So, so we recognise that you can't do everything all the time. Um, the good news is that just this week, um, SIPFA, who are, as you know, are the public sector accountancy organisation, have announced that they, are, they have launched a new... Uh, training programme specifically for councillors on borrowing and treasury management that they are offering up um, now as a as a new offer, partly, although not exclusively, but partly in response to the Commission's report. So, so the combination of that with what councils do themselves, with the the bit of work that we've published alongside this, and of course, uh, councils can always ask their external auditors to to help them with some of this. We hope there's enough support there for them. Obviously, we need we need people to to want to do some of that, and I hopefully this. This opening up of this of this area, which has been quite, you know, it's been seen as a technical thing that's been done by the director of finance. Hopefully, that will encourage more people to come forward and, and do the training. Uh, is there an expectation for councils to become experts in public finance? No, absolutely not. Um, as, as Pauline um, has already said, uh, you, you don't need to be an expert to, to ask some basic questions about borrowing maturity and how you're going to repay debt and what you're using it for and is it the best option or are there alternatives? Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. I think you've answered quite a lot of the questions I had. There's just a, a something you said earlier on, Mr Sharp, <coughs> and it was about the reports written with elected members and public in mind. Now, I know you've answered some of the, the stuff there. Are we looking at... Um, for the sake of the councillors who are looking at making a decision, for one thing, they're going to need some fairly technical information to follow a Treasury plan. Now, if that's the case, they're going to need a bit more than perhaps a generalisation that may appear. And we've heard from Ms Diamond earlier on that some of these reports uh, that go through to full council um, are references to, I assume, the local audit committee or an officer's report but they're not actually giving them reams and reams of uh, report material. It's been there as a reference. And, of course, if the councillors get it wrong in their decision-making, the local press is likely to come back at them and say he hasn't done or she hasn't done the necessary uh, uh, homework, if you like, to come to a decision when it was there in black and white, etc., etc. Et it seems to me that we're asking of a bit of a double standard if you're looking at what's available for uh, a general public um, report, if you like, as against what somebody needs to make an informed decision. How do you reconcile that? The, the full report is there, available to the councillors, and they have it in all the minutes. The, the way in which it was explained, certainly in Scottish Borders, I found very helpful in that the explanations were in the report. So there was a good paragraph of explanation together with each, with each piece of financial information. So they had the three-year prudential indicators, but they had a really clear explanation of how this affected the council. I contrasted that with one which just said, here are the prudential codes, we satisfy the prudential code, end of story. It, it seemed, some councils seemed to give a very kind of closed description, which didn't encourage any questions. But I think the Scottish Borders one was an example of where you can have combine the detailed information and the understandable explanation, but you, you read them in some detail. Yeah. 
And what, what we found was that actually when it came to members asking questions, that because there wasn't that level of narrative in, in the reports, that they had to ask a lot of um, questions about the content and ask for clarification on the content rather than the, the scrutiny questions. So that if a report does tell the story more, does explain the, why, the, why the credential indicators show the trend that they're showing and what that means for the council and what their strategy is, then there's more opportunity for the members to be able to ask those scrutiny questions on that information rather than spending the time clarifying exactly what is in, is in the report. So we're just asking, really asking that um, officers think about explaining in their reports in a clear fashion exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what that means for the council. Mm -hmm. I think in the report we're, we're looking at it from both ends. On, on the one hand, we are recommending that education for councillors is improved, but on the other hand, we are uh, recommending that, that the information that's fed to councillors is, is clearer for the layman. I mean, for example, to say all our borrowing meets the requirements of the Prudential Code um, it conveys a rather different message from um, we've checked and all our borrowing is sustainable for the next three years. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing one needs to get behind. Could I have one more? Um, yeah, I mean, my experience in this is really as a councillor in Edinburgh and what was brought through in terms of treasury management here, uh, here in the city was it could be quite complicated at times because of, I assume the nature of the size of the city budget and all the other things that come through. But it's really a case of just determining, if we're trying to simplify things for people who are not qualified uh, in treasury management, obviously have to pitch the training at a particular level that the basic minimum standards of scrutiny could be adhered to. Uh, how, um, how do we get around the fact that there are Shall we say there has been examples in the past in various authorities that the view of officials want to be put through in a particular manner of uh, they wish a decision to be made by the councillors. And the wording, the councillors got to understand the wording that is put in that makes sure that they're the ones who understand what the decision is through, shall we say, the public sector office or jargon speak and how to break through that? Well, as I said, I think part, part of the responsibilities on officials to, to make sure they inform councillors in a clear and objective fashion such that proper decisions can be made, and, and that's that's part of, of the equation. But, I mean, Fraser? And, and I think that's the, the million-dollar question, really, which is that there is a bit of a cultural issue at the heart of all of this, which is, historically, this has been seen as a thing that's been done by the finance people um, who do it well, and it's professionally run, as we say, and members completely understandably place their trust and reliance on those people. I think what we're saying is that, well, we're not challenging that relationship because it's important. It needs to be opened up a bit. It needs to be less of a black box. There needs to be more explanation in a way that councillors understand um, and can properly challenge and ask questions on. And I think, as Pauline mentioned there, there is a way of writing reports that either seeks to kind of close down or minimise debate and discussion, or you can op write a report in a way that actually openly seeks that kind of debate and questioning, and I think what the Commission is saying is we want we want Council to be moving towards those things. So there's a bit of a push and pull here thing. I think Councillors need to be saying we want and need different information presented differently, and Councillors need to, uh, sorry, Officers need to be in a position to be providing that. Page, page six of the report has a whole list of recommendations for Council Officers, which address many of the points that you've raised about explaining more clearly the affordability, the links to capital investment, why we're doing this, and not just saying, can we borrow full stop? You actually write it in such a manner yes. that it's understandable yes. uh, for the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, do councillors really understand um, borrowing and um, treasury management and their commitment as role of scrutiny? Because when you go to page 37, exhibit 15, when you look at attendance at scrutiny committees, by councillors is pretty low, and which is something that's a real vital function within the committee st structure within councils. I, I have to say, look, looking at the table, um, one can't be other than d disappointed at, at some of the attendance figures, but, but I don't know what the stories are beha behind that. Um, and, and we touched earlier on um, councils perhaps being a bit more 
um, thoughtful about how they present training to to improve uh, the take up because um, as as we've been saying and, and said earlier, uh, the financial sustainability is isn't something you can put uh, to the side and you can you can deal with main council business and then financing can be done as a sort of separate exercise. These days, it, it, it is a major constraint on the ability to provide services and it has to be uh, in centre stage integrated with, with the other council decisions. Um, on page 15, Exhibit, uh, exhibit 5, um, 2012 to 2013, 60% of the borrowings to be repaid between 10 and 50 years. With uncertainty, nobody could predict budgets the future budgets of councils. Is this not storing up a problem for the future? Well, <laughs> to an extent one can't see where we'll be in 50 years. I'm, I'm not sure how, how um, best to answer that. But I th again, you need to look, I think, at, at the specifics of individual councils. And I, I mean, clearly, if you, if you had a council that, that was struggling to, to meet its financial obligations and you saw that those financial obligations were going to continue and perhaps even increase for a very lengthy period of time that would that would be of considerable concern if on the other hand a council can reasonably well cope with its um its financial obligations looking out say 10 years um one might be a bit more uh, sanguine about um the, the the assumption that that could continue for the 40 years after that. So certainly there's an intergener intergenerational issue that um, what, what, what one can't and, and certainly wouldn't wish to, to sort of supplement current funds at the cost of, of the future. Um, but I, I think one's, one's got to be um, sort of measured about it. And, and if, if we could push the three years out to 10 years and, and you're getting sensible results at that level, then um, I, I think one could be more relaxed about the 40 years following. I, I don't know, Fraser, no, if you... Fine, good, thanks. Uh, the training issue concerning councillors is that, I mean, has it ever been considered that training for councillors on the financial elements of the decisions that are taken uh, should be compulsory? I mean, there's many other jobs and roles where people are required to carry out training as part of their, their contractual obligations. And I see that as a former councillor as well. Um, we, so I think that's a very good question, um, convener. And we we uh, we do say in, the, in a recommendation on page seven that uh, they should consider. So councils, officers, and councillors should consider whether it should be mandatory. I don't think it, we, the commission felt it was for us to go as far as to say it definitely should be. But I think what we are saying is that on, on a couple of levels, both. Um, for all councillors, as Graham mentioned right at the start, there is a need for a level of financial literacy and understanding that probably wasn't the case 10 years ago. So there's a kind of basic level. And then I think there is also a case for people who have specific roles, either in a finance committee or a policy and resources committee or an audit committee, to have a deeper level of understanding. And we would um, strongly encourage, I guess, um, the councils to be doing that. I think there are compulsory courses in other parts of the council, I think, in licensing the arrangements that are... I think that's part, right. In, in, terms of the, judicial, indeed, yeah. in terms of some of the statutory and yeah. regulatory functions, yeah. for sure. And I think, and I think, well, this isn't one of those, it feels like such an important issue that if you were considering anything to, else to be mandatory, this would have to be pretty near the top of the list, I think. Yes. OK, a very brief final question from Chris Smith. Um, I mean, I suppose a general point we've discussed, um, uh, how you encourage councillors to... Um, take part in training and also um, their understanding of the reports that are given to them and the role of officers in, in improving and encouraging all of that. Um, to who, though, are, are officers um, responsible in the sense that they have a number of different responsibilities? So it, do you believe that the balance is right in terms of the responsibility to the clerk, the chief executive of the council, to the administration in the council, or is or surely this part of the work um, you know, suggests a responsibility to the council as a whole and to the area that the council um, is responsible for. 
Yeah, there's a really in, a whole bunch of interesting stuff in there, and I think for the purposes of this, I think it's worth remembering that in every council there is a section nine, 95 officer, a proper officer of finance, who statutorily, if that's a word, um, is responsible for giving advice to the council. So regardless of what, what the political makeup is or the chief executive, the section 95 officer role is absolutely key in all of this in the same way that the, the chief executive as head of paid services is accountable to the council and not to the administration of of the day. So um, that, for the purposes of this exercise, the section 95 officer is a key role, I think. Okay. Uh, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank the panel for their uh, contribution. I understand there's a number of recall as a number of uh, commitments to follow up with correspondence, so I'm sure that will take place. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah. Yeah, just a brief suspension for a couple of minutes, colleagues, just allow the change over. Agenda item number three will take evidence from Audit Scotland on the AGS report entitled Update on Developing Financial Reporting. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Carolyn Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, uh, Mark Taylor, the Assistant Director, and Gordon Snail, the Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. I understand that the Auditor General has a, a brief opening statement. The report I'm bringing to the committee today provides an update on the actions the Scottish Government is taking to further develop its approach to public financial reporting. The committee might recall that I've previously emphasised the importance of comprehensive, transparent and reliable financial reporting in my report of July 2013. Scotland's public finances are now on the cusp of significant change, with the introduction of new financial powers through the Scotland Act from today and the prospect of further financial devolution in future. This is obviously happening at a time when public services are facing considerable pressures from falling budgets and increasing demand. So the quickly changing environment for public finances means that the case for financial transparency as part of a strong fiscal framework has never been stronger. The Scotland Act 2012 and the changes that are anticipated to flow from the Smith Commission Agreement mean that the Scottish Government will in future be responsible for raising more of its revenue and will have more responsibilities for spending. Its budget will also become more dependent on Scotland's economic performance and the amount it raises through taxation and spends on welfare will be more directly affected by its own policy decisions. As a result, the Scottish Government will have more control over and more responsibility for its finances. This provides an opportunity for new approaches and also brings new financial risks. Transparent reporting is more important than ever to support decision-making, safeguard public confidence and maintain effective accountability. This position is of course reflected in the Smith Commission's recommendation that the Scottish Parliament should expand and strengthen the independent scrutiny of the public finances. The Smith Commission also called for an updated fiscal framework to support further devolution. 
maintaining and enhancing transparent financial reporting of the public finances in Scotland is an essential component in this quickly changing context. In the light of the new financial powers for the Scottish Parliament, we think that information could be enhanced to show more clearly things like how the different elements of funding support total government spending, how the performance of the economy is affecting budgets, and the financial position of the Scottish public sector as a whole. I think it's important to be clear that the audited accounts of the Scottish Government and other public bodies already provide a good starting point for understanding their financial position, but they don't show the overall position of the devolved Scottish public sector as a whole, including the balance between funding and spending and the overall level of borrowing. Consolidated public sector accounts that pull together information in one place on what the Scottish public sector owns and owes overall, we think would provide a better understanding of the financial position. This would give the Scottish Parliament, taxpayers and decision makers a fuller picture of where money is spent and the longer term implications for the public finances. The Scottish Government does recognise the need to further develop its financial reporting and it's currently considering options for the future. The next step is for the Scottish Government to set out the details of its proposals for consultation with the Parliament. We in Audit Scotland will continue to monitor progress and report publicly as the Scottish Government develops its plans. We'll also continue to play our part in helping to develop a high-quality fiscal framework for Scotland that reflects the new financial powers and the related opportunities and challenges. As always, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions from the committee. Okay, uh, thank you. And can I just uh, start in terms of the first question? And you made reference, uh, or the general made reference to the consolidated public accounts. Uh, can I just ask you to, to provide some of the history into why we've not arrived at the position where we have consolidated accounts and what happens in other parts of the, the UK and perhaps further than that? <coughs> I'll ask colleagues to chip in, but I'll, I'll sort of just outline the broad picture first, if I may, convener. Um, I think our starting point is that up until this point, actually there hasn't been a particularly strong case for consolidated um, accounts for the whole of the Scottish public sector. Until now, what the Scottish Government has been doing is broadly um, putting forward a budget to the Parliament that sets out how to spend the bulk of the money that comes from, through the block grant from Westminster and some small additions from things like non-domestic rate income and small amounts of money for, from other sources. As of today, that's changing quite markedly. From today, the Parliament also has responsibilities for raising taxes this year through the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and the Scottish Landfill Tax, from next year through the Scottish Rate of Income tax proceeds. It has some limited borrowing powers from this year increasing in the years ahead. And the Smith Commission sets out a clear direction of travel for more revenue to be raised here in Scotland through decisions of the government and the parliament and for more responsibilities in terms of borrowing and likely welfare responsibilities in future. All of that means that the financial reporting that we've had in the past suddenly doesn't give you a full enough picture to really understand the implication of decisions about taxation, about the balance between different types of tax, about borrowing and potentially in future on welfare spending. So it's very much a moment in time where we think that this becomes necessary. It's interesting to note that the Scottish Government does have the power to produce those consolidated accounts already. We think there's not been a strong case for using it so far, but we think that is changing quite fast just now. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? I think the only thing I would add, Auditor General, thank you, is I, I, I think I think this issue came up to a degree earlier, is that the Scottish Government are quite clear about where accountability lies and are quite clear that uh, there is an existing set of accounts for the Scottish Government consolidated accounts and there are different sets of accounts for different bodies. I think in the history that Caroline set out, it's, felt that it's been felt that those vehicles are the vehicles for that accountability and to provide details on the uh, expenditure of those individual bodies. As Caroline said, we're in change, it's changing times and uh, we're quite clear that as the, the, the level of responsibility increases, that there's a real opportunity to bring in consolidated public accounts from here. I mean, would it have been considered good practice to do it, though? You know I mean, or would it have been difficult to, to, you know, to, to pull together such accounts in the first place? I mean, what, what's been the potential barrier to that? I, I think um, 
it, it's a, a terrible and I mean historically going way back sure. to when the panel was first formed sure. I don't mean even just in the last I, I think as, as I said back in 1999-2000 there wasn't a strong case for it anyway but this is also a field that's changing quite hard across the UK and globally um, so for example the United Kingdom government now produces whole of government accounts but it's only done that for the last five years the fifth set were published just last week um, and during that period their ability to do it has been increasing the usefulness of the accounts the information included has been growing and developing so it's not that the Scottish government I think is behind the pace it's that this is an area where prat good practice is evolving quite fast and what makes sense for Scotland is also changing there clearly is a cost to doing this although we don't think it's a, a significant cost in, in terms of the benefits but the balance of what you get in return for the effort for producing the accounts we think is, is tipping markedly in favour of producing them. Combiti. Thank you Vera. Um, <clears throat> just a matter of interest, to what extent is Audit Scotland working with the Scottish Government on, on this issue? Closely, I think, as you would expect, Mr Beattie. Um, it's, an, it's an issue which we discuss in terms of um, our own views about what good practice looks like and the plans that they have. Um, we've reported in here the Scottish Government's commitment to developing its financial reporting in this context. Mark, as the person who leads the audit of Scottish Government for me each year, um, is in close contact with the Director General responsible for finance and colleagues about it and may want to give you a bit more flavour for, for the way we go about that. I think, I think it's fair to say that uh, we've been in active and, and, and constant discussion about what plans are and how those are developing. I think it's also fair to say that there is an important distinction between our role as auditors and, of course, the role of, audit, as, of Scottish Government in making the decisions around this. I think what we do is we put questions to them, we make suggestions, we get into an engagement and discussion around that. Ultimately, it's for the government to decide and ultimately it's for us as auditors to come back at the back of that and to begin to audit how well that system's working which, uh, from a kind of whole system perspective and we'd look to be able to do that. So I think it's important that although we do have that engagement, we don't muddle up who's deciding how this should work. So from your uh, close relationship with the Scottish Government in this regard, uh, do you believe that they're on the path to um, delivering the enhanced financial reporting you're looking for? I think that's hard for us to say for two reasons. One, um, as Marcus said, the government's responsible for developing its own plans. We know they're doing that. We haven't had detailed involvement on what those plans look like. The second reason is that whatever the Scottish government produces in terms of financial reporting needs to meet the needs of this parliament. And we understand there is a commitment to consulting on the parliament about uh, how far the reporting needs to go to do that. I think what we're uh, looking to do is to move forward the debates to help the parliament think through what it requires and to set out our view as auditors of what good practice would look like to help inform that debate. Obviously, quite rightly, your paper here focuses on the, the Scottish Government and uh, its need for uh, ensuring the greatest transparency. But, ha but with the delegation of further powers and you know, a much changed relationship with uh, organisations such as the Treasury and so on, is there an extent to which the uh, need for more transparency in that interlocking relationship should extend to UK bodies? Um, I the short answer to that is, is clearly yes, and I think there will need to be a dialogue about the extent to which this Parliament needs greater um, insight into, potentially oversight over, some of the bodies which play an important part in achieving the Scottish Government's objectives. Um, but in broad terms at the moment, we are in a position where the UK Government produces whole-of-government accounts which include the whole of the Scottish public sector. What we haven't got is that intermediate layer that gives the Scottish public sector as a whole for people here in Scotland, starting with this Parliament to use, um, as well as for the Treasury, the UK Government and people on the, U the wider UK stage to show an interest in. Thank you. Thank you. Can I firstly, ask, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Audit Scotland for pushing this agenda really hard, because I think it's very, very important. Um, how difficult would it be to produce consolidated accounts? We don't, it would require effort. We don't think it's at all impossible for the government to do. As part of the, the UK whole of government accounts, the Scottish government and all other public bodies already produce returns which allow that consolidation to happen. Those returns are funneled through um, the Scottish government to HM Treasury and our auditors play a part in pro providing assurance on them. The missing step is pulling it together for Scotland. So there would be more effort required, but it, we're not starting from scratch. A lot of experience has built 
built up over the last mm. five years mm. as the UK whole of government accounts have gained currency. Uh, and it was striking me that when you were describing that earlier on, there are a whole of UK accounts. That presumably means we produce a whole of Scotland account, because how can we produce a whole of UK one if we don't produce a whole of Scotland one? Colleagues will keep me straight, but that's actually not quite the case. What happens at the moment is that each of the 200 or so bodies that make up the Scottish public sector produce their returns, and it's a, a complicated process to do that, to allow you to take out the transactions that, that um, go on between individual bodies and between Scottish bodies and UK bodies. But those are then transmitted through to the Treasury for consolidation to happen. The consolidation for Scotland doesn't currently happen, and that would be the additional step that's needed. The information and the processes are all there already, I think. But broadly speaking, if we decided to have consolidated Scottish accounts, we could do it within a financial year. It would not be a, an enormous accounting challenge in a... It, it would be doable, and yeah. I would expect that as, in, as at a UK level, there would be lessons to be learnt on the way. Sure. The first set, I think, would have improvements to be made. Mark may want to talk about some of the complexities that we think would need to be worked through in doing that. I, th I, think, I think what's there at the moment is the basic building blocks and the individual bodies prepare information on, on a broadly consistent form. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real challenge in then putting, those, putting that building, those building blocks together and also presenting the right information, appropriate information that re reflects the Scottish context in a way that the accounts themselves are not just a dry document that adds up figures, consolidates figures, although there's value in that, but also has the right commentary in there and the right disclosures and notes in there. And I think that's where I get a bit more of the investment might need to be put in. I think inevitably there are technical challenges. It's not simply adding up the numbers. One of the main challenges is in eliminating uh, transactions between individual parts of government, uh, funding from one part of government to another part of government, identifying the exact amount, and even more challenging than that, who owes who what. Uh, so although there's detailed information available to all bodies on where their debts are, there's real challenges in aggregating that up and having some of the, 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 the elimination of those transactions and uh, the, some real technical challenges in how that happens. And those are some of the challenges that uh, NEO have identified in putting together whole of government accounts at a UK level. As a number of us will recall, we passed this legislation in 2000, so we must have envisaged at that time that it was possible to do this. And yeah, um, one point on your uh, observation about what's not in the accounts: uh, the more we're not, some of our schools are not going ahead because or they're being delayed because of uh, an accounting procedure relating out of Europe and so on and so forth. Is this the kind of thing that could potentially be tidied up by having consolidated accounts? Because that seems to relate to how the hub codes are either on balance or off balance. All this debate that's been in the UK accounts for a long time. Could we clean all that up by having consolidated accounts? I'll start off, and I think Gordon may want to come in behind that. One of the things that we don't have clear oversight of, because we don't have UK, uh, Scotland Hall of Government Accounts, is on the one hand all of the assets that we have across the Scottish public sector. That's important to know whether you're maintaining them or if they're being allowed to degrade in the face of financial challenges. It also can help in thinking about how you make the best use of assets across the public sector. But also some key liabilities, like the public sector pension liability for Scotland as a whole. It appears in a number of different places. We don't pull it together to say what what is it across Scotland? So it's those sorts of insights that we think would be very useful to this Parliament, but also much more widely in terms of decision making and accountability. And to go back to um, the point that was being asked about earlier on, you're not aware as Audit Scotland whether the, the Scottish Government are currently looking at that consolidation as part of their uh, entirely correct approach to, to more transparency and greater accountability of government accounts. I think that would be a question for yeah, the Scottish absolutely. Government. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Can I ask one other area, if I may? I, I thought uh, your recommendation, or rather your conclusion, is very strong on forecasting. And you've also say some, you make some, in my view, pertinent observations about the Office of Budget Responsibility being independent of government and therefore able to provide that. Do you think that? Um, that it, it is essential that in the new um, machinery we have in Scotland there is uh, that the, the Fiscal Commission is independent so as to be able to provide exactly the correct check and balance irrespective of who the government is as happens south of the border. I think, I think the details of the remit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is a policy matter and one for this Parliament. But the principles that are set out in OECD guidance of um, transparency, non-partisanship and independence are absolutely central. Um, and the legislation that's being proposed to put it on a statutory, statutory footing needs to protect those. I know that's a very strong theme in the consultation paper, but it seems to us critical, as it is for our own work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, and uh, good morning. Um, so paragraphs 21 to 25 uh, in the report, uh, I would suggest, are, uh, are positive because um, it, it does appear that the Scottish Government uh, are, very, are very well aware that, uh, obviously with the changing financial landscape, they are prepared to, to look at the, the improving 
uh, the, the financial uh, mechanisms. Is that a, an accurate assumption? We, we've tried in the report, as in all our work, to give credit for what the Scottish Government has achieved, including a good record of financial management so far, um, strong uh, financial statements for each of the individual bodies, and a commitment to taking it further. What we would like to see in the light of the speed of change happening in the environment is, is more information for the Parliament about the plans, the detail of those plans, and how they'll um, give effect to our recommendations in practice. Thank you. Um, so in paragraph 28... Um, also the, the report highlights uh, the situation regarding the, uh, the budget, uh, Scottish budget documents, uh, but also there's, there's a part particular uh, kind of sentence here that the Scottish Government's budget will become more dependent on Scotland's economic performance and the amount the Scottish Government raises through taxation and spends on welfare will be affected by its policy decisions. Now, I accept that they are very much uh, accurate uh, comments, uh, but you do go on to highlight uh, that it has been recognised the need to further develop its budget documents and annual accounts to reflect these new responsibilities. If a Scottish Government of whichever, uh, uh, whichever hue, um, if they uh, are uh, putting forward a set of proposals uh, to try to improve the economic, uh, uh, the economic um, situation in Scotland, um, but uh, because our budget process takes some six months, whereas the budget process um, at Westminster um, is a, it's a different process altogether, uh, then there, there is a, a potential for um, last-minute decisions uh, to come from Westminster to then have that effect upon Scotland. Uh, and as a consequence, the budget documents, budget proposals put forward by a Scottish Government, uh, part of them might actually be um, either well, negated or uh, of, uh, have a, an adverse impact. Uh, how then could a Scottish Government uh, of the day uh, try to try to deal with that, and particularly when it comes to the reporting and the auditing. I absolutely recognise the challenge. I'm not sure we're the people to help you with the answer to it. Um, what what we're saying is that the need for that budget scrutiny by this Parliament increases further from what we've had over the first 15 years because of the importance of those taxation and welfare decisions that will need to be taken in future. Clearly, in the political context we're, we're working in now, there are challenges about the way that's joined up with what happens in Westminster and the way um, decisions about things like adjustments to the Barnet formula are made as well. All of that requires a great deal of thought and attention by both parliaments and ideally working together. Um, I think what we can help you with is some of the things we think should be there in terms of the good practice on fiscal responsibility, which is a strong commitment this government has made since its election in 2007. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart McMillan um, highlighted there the issue of um, uh, forecasting, essentially, for economic uncertainty. Um, to what extent, uh, and the impact that, that changes in Scotland's economic performance would then have on the money available to fund public services and other things, um, to, to what extent is that the driver of the need uh, for a consol consolidated account, that you need to know how much you're spending because you have this concern about... Uh, what you'll be taking in in the future? I don't think that's particularly a strong driver. Correct. Clearly, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, in its first report, um, endorsed the government's forecasts, um, but also recommended the development of more data and the development of, of a better understanding of things like the behavioural impact um, on taxation changes of, of likely responses. Um, I think what we're saying is very much in line with the conversation you were having with my colleagues from the Accounts Commission earlier on, but at the Scotland wide level, having that overall picture of what your current um, financial position looks like helps to make better decisions about uh, tax and other spending decisions. Um, and also, we know already that in the UK, the whole of government accounts are a very important input to the OBR's fiscal sustainability report that they produce twice a year. So it's information that can be used by other people in helping exactly that decision rather than necessarily doing it, it itself. Mark, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think so. I think that... that the, the main thing that, Scot that whole of government accounts equivalent or Scottish public con uh, consolidated accounts would give is that overarching view that allows you to essentially manage longer-term financial risks, to know, based on the decisions you're taking today, uh, what 
some of the potential implications on those risks might be down the line, both in terms of the liabilities that are being carried across the whole system and where assets lie across the whole system. And one of the things that the, 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 the National Audit Office reports in its uh, report on whole government accounts, the last uh, version which was just published within the last week or so, are some of their uses that whole of government accounts, now that they've been available for a number of years, are increasingly put to. I think one of the key things from a set of accounts is that they are, are, are pulled together in accordance with clear standards, inter international financial reporting standards, and audited. And therefore, the information that's available there can be used by others, can be used by the Parliament, with that real trust in the information that's there. Thank you, uh, Kimura. Uh, I don't usually do points of order, but uh, I didn't want to interrupt uh, the Auditor General with her comments. Uh, I just want to get it on the record that at no point did I uh, use that language that, uh, that Drew Smith uh, alleges that I did a few moments ago, uh, particularly uh, regarding the, the point. Okay. Uh, two options here. I mean, Drew, can we consider it? Or? Well, well, I, I'm sorry if upset, Mr McMillan. I, I thought he was referring to the fact that there will be an element of variability. Um, in the future revenue that uh, government has as a result of decisions that it chooses to make around the raising of revenue in Scotland. But if that's not an accurate reflection of no, what he meant, then I'm happy for Mr. Whelan to clarify okay, what so he did so mean, if that's easier just, on the record. Just, clarify, so just, just say that obviously Stuart McMillan has clarified that point and hopefully we can move on from that. If there's any further information, we can refer to the official report at sure. a later stage. Just to add in response to Mr Smith's question. Sorry, it was a very minor point. I just to emphasise the importance uh, of whole government accounts and so far as an audit arrangements around about that, because I think it's important the information that's brought through the whole government accounts um, in the UK sense and whatever's down the road for Scotland, that they are audited. So there's an independent check and process behind that that forms a good basis for uh, discussion in, in Parliament and for other people to have confidence through that process. Tread carefully, but if I understood, <laughs> uh, if I understood your response to Mr. Scott, um, you said uh, that to, to an extent that the, a lot, all, all this information about public bodies in Scotland is already collected. It's just that it goes to the the UK level and isn't consolidated a, in a Scottish manner. Hopefully, that's acceptable um, to, to have Scott as a as a rephrasing of of his answer, but um, or the answer he was given. Um, so that presumably then would, thinking about our previous session, that would then include local authorities in Scotland, um, uh, which we don't currently have a, a, a Scottish government or a Scottish level um, accounting of that. Um, but because it does exist at the UK level, I suppose it, it kind of the fact that it already exists at that level gives me less concern. But is there a tension between um, the pulling together this information and then presumably the scrutiny of it um, for other purposes? Um, Referring back to what we said earlier, I mean, local, go local government is independent, and these are all independent bodies. Is there a danger that we are that we are accumulating information at the Scottish level, which suggests a degree of scrutiny um, and concern that is actually properly for the local level? Really important point, and I was interested in Mr Beattie's question earlier around it. There's no question that local authorities in Scotland are responsible for their own finances, including borrowing and other long-term commitments that they enter into, um, and nobody wants to blur that accountability, um, either for good reasons of principle or because there's a risk of spooking the people who are lending the money. There's no question about that at all. Um, what we are saying, though, is that um, in Scotland... Uh, as in the UK, local authorities make a significant contribution to the delivery of the government's, government's policy objectives and the services that it's responsible for. And if a local authority were to find itself in a position where it couldn't meet its obligations, there is a strong likelihood that the Scottish Government would need to step in, not so much to service the debt, but to ensure that the services could continue to be provided. Um, and that there's therefore a relationship between the two sets of accounts, um, which we think needs to be recognised, as it already is within the UK whole of government accounts. They do consolidate all local authorities across the UK into that overall picture. Um, that hasn't caused any confusion about the accountabilities or where the liability sits. It has, though, helped to give that bigger picture of what the liabilities are, which is what consolidated accounts would do, and to provide information about things like the um, maturity dates, the lengths of loans and other commitments, um, pensions liabilities, and the assets that, that sit alongside that. So you get that whole picture of what the risks really might be at the high level, as well as at the level of each of the individual bodies that make up the Scottish Public Services. 
that, that's helpful. Just finally, um, Convener, if, if I could. Um, so if the UK government has uh, this information accumulated at, at the UK level, and I have no objection to the, 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 the Scottish government taking lead to, to provide the same information at the Scottish level, um, but are you aware, of, is, there, is there any discussion with the Scotland office in terms of if the information is held at the UK level, surely it would be... It, it, a simpler job for the Scotland office to accumulate that information across UK government um, and consolidate information for Scotland in that way, rather than separately trying to do it from uh, the point of view of the devolved administration. I actually think, given the way that the um, the devolution settlement is evolving, it's it's entirely appropriate for the Scottish government itself to keep that ownership okay. of the picture for Scotland and to be contributing to the UK wide picture as well. Um, the the information, the technical administration, is already handled by the Scottish government, working with Treasury. Our auditors work closely as part of that process, um, and I think what we're looking for is a straightforward pulling together at the Scotland level that doesn't happen. But as Mark has said, all the building blocks are there at the moment. Okay. Convener, uh, and good morning. Um, I'm conscious that audited consolidated accounts take time to produce. Without worrying about how long that does take, surely Scotland is now entering a point where we're raising taxation, which is to some extent variable and to some slight extent unpredictable. And therefore, our ability as a parliament to scrutinise our financial affairs is now somewhat time dependent. And I'm just wondering, because I haven't heard any part of that in, in this morning's conversation, what your thoughts are, as a General, about how quickly we can be provided with meaningful management accounting data, rather than what I might otherwise describe as the financial accounting a year or two later, which I think is what we've previously discussed. That's a really good question, and one that we've been discussing ourselves and with our colleagues in the Scottish Government. Um, at the moment, the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts, which exclude some important parts of the public sector, are produced um, over the summer each year, audited and laid in the Parliament um, during your, your autumn term. There's no question in my mind that if the Scottish Government were to commit to introducing consolidated public sector accounts, that would take longer. Just to give you an example, the UK whole of government accounts that were published last week related to the 2013-14 financial year and that's the quickest they've ever done them so they have a sort of six month lag and I, I would expect it would take longer here in Scotland as well Having said that, we've been looking at international experience as part of our thinking, and the Government of New Zealand, for example, publishes monthly management accounts effectively, where at the end of, at the end of each month it publishes its financial position at, as at that month, and that's part of the overall financial management approach that they take. Now, that's absolutely an aspirational goal, not something that we think Scotland should be working for short term. But I think there is a debate to be had between the government and the parliament and other interested parties about what your direction of travel should be and what's a reasonable investment to be making given all of the other things that the government needs to be delivering in the context of the Scotland Act, the Smith clauses and so on. So, so there are decisions to be taken and we're certainly not looking for perfection in this. But the direction of travel seems to us an important thing to have clarity around at this stage. Mark wants to add to that. The other thing I'd add to that, I'm agreeing, of course, with, with all of that, is that one of the real values we see in, in, in uh, consolidated public accounts is, is, yes, the information about this year, but much more val valuable the information over a long trend period and what's happening through time. And although there's a real challenge in getting the most up-to-date information out as soon as it possibly can be, that trend information, that has continuing value. And one of the real values in there is understanding what's happening with pension liabilities, under understanding what's happening with debt, understanding what's happening with PPP and NPD commitments over that longer trend. Okay. Uh, thank you. And can I, on behalf of the committee, thank the Auditor General for our presentation. Uh, can I move the committee into a brief five-minute suspension?
Boys, can I <laughs> reconvene uh, and take us to agenda item number four, accountability and audit and further uh, devolution of powers. Uh, on this particular item, we will take evidence in the accountability and audit arrangements of the proposed uh, further devolved powers. Uh, members will be aware that the committee has issued a call for evidence on the subject. Uh, the committee will also hold a further evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy in May. Uh, today, we'll hear evidence from, uh, once again, uh, the Auditor General, uh, Caroline Gardner, uh, from Russell Firth, Assistant Auditor General from Fraser McKinley, Director and Controller of Audit, and finally Mark Taylor, uh, Assistant Director of Audit Scotland. Uh, I understand the Auditor General may have a brief statement. Okay. Caught us out there. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, and can I just ask the first question, Auditor General, uh, in connection with the uh, scrutiny of the public bodies, the UK, the current UK public bodies, uh, and we know there'll be public bodies such as the BBC, Ofgem, and a number of others who will be able to, uh, we will now be able to seek evidence from them potentially, and they'll be able to lay uh, financial reports uh, uh, for the benefit of Parliament. I just wonder if you could elaborate further on uh, how you think this will be progressed. Um, I should say, first of all, Convener, we're delighted to have the chance to talk to you as part of your inquiry on um, future scrutiny under the Scotland Act and the Smith Commission particularly. Um, and we've looked closely at the Smith Commissions that we think may have implications for us and for this committee. Um, the list of bodies that's referred to in the Smith Commission report and picked up in the clauses are all obviously bodies that do carry out functions that can have a significant impact on, contribute to the Scottish Government's policy objectives. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they are a wide-ranging <laughs> set of bodies that, that do that in different ways. Um, taking up at one extreme the Northern Lighthouse Board obviously most of its functions are carried out here in Scotland there's already a fair amount of reporting about that which is available at the other end of the spectrum we've got Ofgem which regulates energy companies right across the UK including both companies that are based here in Scotland that serve the whole of the UK and companies based elsewhere in the UK that serve people in Scotland so we think it's um, the starting point is that there's no single model that will work for this um, it very much needs to start from the purpose of um, what is it that they carry out here in Scotland and what is it that the Scottish Parliament wants more oversight of. It's also worth noting that there already are UK-wide bodies whose annual reports and accounts are laid here in the, Sc in the um, Scottish Parliament, including, for example, the Security Industry Authority. Uh, the fact that the accounts are laid doesn't mean that this committee necessarily needs to do anything with them. Uh, so I think there is a debate there about what the Parliament's and the committee's interest is that should then be leading to a debate about the way in which that might work in practice. Can, can I ask, in, in using the BBC as an example, mm. uh, and when the financial reporting comes from the BBC, is it, would, would that also relate to the BBC licence fee revenue? Um, it's, that's a very good example, I think, to try and pick apart what this Parliament's interest is. Um, clearly, the BBC is a UK-wide organisation which serves people of the UK as a whole, as well as the people of Scotland as a, as a separate grouping within that. Um, at the moment, I think I'm right in saying the BBC currently produces a management review for Scotland, which provides information about the services they provide here. It's not linked to financial information about what's spent in Scotland and the revenue raised from um, licence payers, payers here in Scotland. And I think that's a good example of exactly the sort of body where the Parliament may want to have a discussion with the body, with the UK Parliament, about the development of further um, reports about Scotland in the same way you've been having with the UK government and HMRC about the reporting on the Scottish rate of income tax that will be continue to be collected by a UK-wide body but with a very definite um, Scottish interest. W would there potentially be some challenges here in respect to the, because you know, you've made the point there about discussions with the BBC, uh, you know it's quite clear in terms of the Scotland Act the role of the Public Audit Committee mm -hmm. in that respect in terms of the reports that are laid before us. Is that something that you would expect to, uh, for the UK government to legislate on in terms of how this parliament would interact with those bodies? 
I think there are two sets of issues to be resolved. The first is that um, the number of bodies that do play a role in Scotland is obviously very high, um, and the committee may want to think about which are its priorities in terms of having a very clear oversight of a, a UK-wide body's activities in Scotland um, to make the best use of your time. The second is it will be easier for some bodies than for others to produce annual reports which contain Scotland-specific information. So Northern Lighthouse Board, no problem. Most of what they do here is already Scotland specific. The BBC, some parts of its, act, its activities are very clearly Scotland specific and I think it would be a very productive dialogue to say what information do you want about both spend and performance to allow you to carry out that oversight. For a body like Ofgem, I think it would be much more difficult to think what information would make sense about Scotland specifically in, in their overall business as opposed to specific projects which are being carried out that have a, an impact on Scotland alone. And I think that just gives you, demonstrates the sort of range of different types of bodies we're talking about here and the need to be clear what your interest is so that that information can be developed and reported in ways you can use. Okay, thank you. Mary Scanlon. Um, I, I can appreciate that there is some complexity here and uh, uh, we're in preparation mode. Uh, we've got quite a few additional powers coming today and a whole load of significant powers coming down the line. I can appreciate that one size uh, of auditing may not fit all, but I just wondered um, uh, examples such as Food Standards Agency that has been devolved for many years, although it becomes Food Standards Scotland to, as of today, um, but also the Forestry Commission, <coughs> um, where it's a Great Britain uh, cross-border body, Audit Scotland is the auditor under statute and the agency reports directly to Scottish ministers. So would the Food Standards Agency, as was, uh, or perhaps the Forestry Commission, would that be a good example of, uh, uh, we've had experience of both those agencies, would it be a good example to fit with the further devolved powers coming down the line that uh, Convener just mentioned? Russell to talk you through the way that's worked in the past and yeah. we can then draw out what it might mean for the future. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think um, I think there may be some lessons from the, the, the Forestry Commission, but I'm not sure it provides a, a, a perfect example, partly because ever since um, the, the first Scottish devolution, the business of the Forestry Commission has been very clearly divided up between England, Scotland and Wales. And they've had their own management boards, committees, groups. They've produced separate sets of, uh, of uh, financial statements in each country. Um, and the policies um, that have been uh, employed in each country have differed as the, uh, the business has, uh, as, as devolution has gone on. Um, they still have a lot of central functions, which it's economic to provide on a, a, U, uh, a GB basis, but the, the business itself has been very clearly divided on a geographic basis, whereas some of these um, bodies that are now proposed to lay their uh, reports in Parliament, it's not such a clear separate business in each of the geographical areas. Is there anything, uh, you know, already existing that would be uh, a better fit than, say, the Forestry Commission and the Food Standards Agency? Is there any element of good practice out there that could be adopted to fit some of the new powers coming? For a body like the BBC, I think the nearest parallel probably is the discussions you've already been having with HMRC about their role in collecting the Scottish rate of income tax and in future obviously VAT, part of which will be assigned to Scotland. Um, the, the challenge I think comes for the bodies um, like Ofcom and Ofgem that very much work on a UK wide basis and are regulating um, for the UK companies that serve the whole UK. We don't yet have a model of that and I think that's, that's where there's more thinking to do about what this committee and what the Parliament needs to receive assurance about the performance of of those bodies in relation to Scotland and where there may be more difficulties in breaking down the information in ways that are meaningful to you without doing that at disproportionate cost. My final question, convener, um, and uh, this actually comes from the Parliament's uh, Information Centre uh, 
uh, and it's uh, the no detriment principle. And, um, you know, obviously, which I, I think in layman's terms basically states that the Scottish or UK budget should be no larger or smaller as a consequence of tax and spending changes. Um, now, if we suppose, for example, that the Scottish Government uh, is going to increase the top rate of tax to 50%, uh, Scots could uh, pay less national insurance. Should the Scottish Government compensate UK for fallen national insurance contribution? Or alternately, which uh, often happens with a higher rate of income tax, uh, high-earning Scots could shift their income from earnings to dividends, or higher rate taxpayers could move elsewhere in the UK, in which case uh, should the UK government compensate the Scottish government uh, and I, I, I just see this as a very muddy area. And, uh, you know, can we really expect the no detriment principle to continue clearly and effectively as we go forward with very different powers and very different uh, economic and fiscal decisions? I think your question has highlighted the challenges that will need to be addressed in um, working through. Statement, if I may say. Yeah. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear, convener, that we're, we are very clear of the challenges involved in this. And I think the way in which those challenges are resolved is going to be part of a political process. Our interest is in making sure that the process for making adjustments to the funding formula to Scotland, whatever that looks like in future, are transparent and clearly understood. And that there is a way of providing assurance to this Parliament as well as to the UK Parliament about the um, sums being received into Scotland uh, for spending on Scottish policy objectives. There's lots of work to do in um, making that a reality. We're not the only people to say that, um, and I think it's one of the areas that this Parliament is rightly focusing on at this stage. Open and transparent, given the two examples I've given, um, you know, <coughs> can it be done? Can it be done? I appreciate it's, uh, it's challenging, you know, but can it be... How, how can you, for example, uh, relate increased uh, revenue in the rest of the UK as a result of uh, an increased tax in Scotland? How can you prove that that decision to invest in England was a result of an increased tax? I, I just can't see it in my mind. I, I don't know how you can trace that effectively in terms of the no detriment principle. I think there are both technical challenges, as yeah. you're describing, that, that I'm sure can be worked through with okay. appropriate information and systems in place. And there are obviously political challenges as well. Um, I suspect the political challenges may be the more difficult ones, but, but I'm, I'm very clear that there is work to do to be able to make a reality of that recommendation from Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, my understanding is that the Department of Work and Pensions may well be providing some of the services but nonetheless spending uh, money effectively scottish government money on welfare payments um, if i'm right in that regard how do you see them reporting to us for the way that they are spending that fraction of what is now or going to be our budget please for the welfare responsibilities that are proposed to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, the, the Government and the Parliament have a choice to make about how they're administered. And broadly, I think there are three options. One is that the Department for Work and Pensions, as you say, could continue administering it under Scottish Government rules. The second is that the Scottish Government could seek to set up its own body to do that work in the way it has done Revenue Scotland. Or the third is that it could look at other um, options which are in place uh, in the way that, for example, councils currently administer housing benefit and council tax benefit. Each of those would have different um, implications for the information that this parliament would need and would have access to. And I'll maybe ask Russell to outline that for you, if I may. Yep, thank you. The, um, if the parliament did decide to continue with the DWP administering um, Scottish benefits, then I think actually the HMRC arrangements that are being developed for Scottish rate of income tax actually do provide a very good model there, whereby the UK legislation that's, uh, that gives effect to that could make similar arrangements for the DWP to report to the Scottish Parliament as well as to the UK Parliament and potentially follow that through with the similar um, arrangements for, for audit as well. So 
implication of that is you feel there's a model in there, not only for the DWP, but potentially for any other UK government department which is doing something for the Scottish government, which it used to do for itself, but is now spending our money. Where it is spending money that the Scottish Parliament has control over, yes. Yes, right, OK. I'm wondering then if I could just convene her to, to, to a different <coughs> issue, which is simply actually to return to, to the previous discussion, which is essentially about the risks involved in discretionary expenditure and discretionary income, um, and how, in the context of, of the developing uh, situation, you feel that that could be audited. I, I don't think we would be looking to audit the risks. Um, I think our interest is in making sure that the information is available for, this, for the government to use in making decisions and making policy, for this parliament to use in scrutinising um, the government's actions, and for um, bodies like the Scottish Fiscal Commission to use in uh, their own work on reporting on fiscal sustainability. That's exactly the way that the OBR currently uses UK whole of governments at the moment hold of government accounts, looking at things like um, the government's commitments on public sector pensions uh, and other long-term liabilities to estimate over the longer term, 25 years and out, what that means against the changes in the population and known policy commitments. We would see the, the, the transparent reporting we're proposing being used in the same way by the Scottish Fiscal Commission as all of this develops. Right, that does leave me inexorably to precisely the same point that was in the last discussion about timing and how long do we have to wait because risk and time are inevitably intertwined. Do you, do you feel we're moving to a point where information will be available soon enough for the right people to be making the right judgments and for, particularly for us as parliamentarians to be able to scrutinise the risks involved in those decisions? I think it's hard for us to give you any assurance about that without knowing the detail of the government's plans for developing its financial reporting. But I'll maybe ask Mark to talk in a bit more detail than we did in the earlier session about what we think is um, needed and what we think is likely to be possible. Thank you, Auditor General. I, th I think in terms of the, the time timetable, I think there's, there's something about the information being made available as quickly as it can be and an investment around that, of course. But there's also there's something about the commentary around some of the risks that arises from not knowing that, that, that there is there is inevitably where there's uh, uh, more more variability and, and, and less that's absolutely certain there's more risk in there and to be open about that and be clear where that uncertainty and where that variability is I think that's where enhanced financial reporting would be more open about that and be able to talk about some of those things so that it Yes, of course, you would like more information, but at least you're, the, the decision makers are clear about where the information gaps are and what, what is known and what is estimated and what is forecast, and as much as possible, the reliability of all of that. Thank you. It's worth making a point for those who might want to report this, that the word risk here is really being used as uncertainty. There's no risk in anybody falling over or going bankrupt or anything. This is actually about just not having accuracy in the information that you do have when it's historical. That's yeah. absolutely the way in which we use risk as auditors in the same yeah. way that you're using, Mr. Don, yes. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you, convener. Um, we talked about earlier the, the no detriment uh, principle, which has seen quite a lot of attention. And, um, I mean, in essence, that's, that's about there being no detriment at the point of transfer rather than uh, it being in any way related to the policy decisions that you would then take, because otherwise... You know, it could easily become a no-benefit principle if you um, if you interpreted it in that way. So, from your point of view, as I don't expect you to comment on the politics of the debate around that, but it, as as the auditor, um, what is the need for um, independent uh, sources of information and scrutiny of information in re in relation to how you agree uh, or at the point of transfer, whether it's at the point that something's devolved or at some subsequent point when there's when there's a policy change. It's always very hard to talk about this in the abstract yeah. because you, you, you're inevitably talking about hypotheticals and, and the way it might work through. I think what we're seeing in the Smith clauses is a number of different um, either sources of revenue raising powers for the Scottish Parliament or spending responsibilities. Um, and for each of those, there will need to be an agreed mechanism for tracing through what, as you say, at the point of transfer is the likely impact and what the adjustment will be to the Scottish block grant on the back of that. 
Um, I think the, the first of all, making sure that the information that's needed to underpin that forecast and the expectation being available and agreed will be important. And then secondly, the ability for that to be scrutinised by this Parliament and by people more widely, the transparency around it, will also be a key part of building confidence, but also highlighting where there may be problems that need to be addressed by developing new information sources. Um, it, it feels like sort of word of the day a stuck record, but that transparency I think is a key part of it, as well as getting the technical process right of understanding what might change and what information can be used, what information gaps need to be filled, making sure that that is aired and understood as widely as it can be <coughs> will be a key part of that. Russell may want to add to it? Yes, just, just to add, add to it that, yes, in some cases there may well be a very technically based agreement that is that can be uh, audited, if you like, um, through specific data. But in other cases, and the London Buildings Transaction Tax First Year Agreement is a, probably a classic example of that, at the end of the day, it is a negotiated agreement between the two governments. In the London Building Transaction Tax case, it's uh, a, a revenue stream that is very volatile over the economic cycle, according to house sales. Um, and you can audit what has happened in each year, but the agreement at the end of the day is an agreement between two governments. That's interesting because, I mean, it, it, in a way, in terms of some of the politics, I mean, a lot of these are contested facts uh, and are likely to be uh, probably into the future contested facts at the time um, that, that things are transferred. So as auditors, your interests will presumably be in, in the process rather than necessarily the amounts that are agreed um, or... Um, you know, reluctantly or enthusiastically between either either party. Speaking narrowly as, as auditors, our interest is in the amount that's agreed and how that flows through into the Scottish Government's accounts. In terms of the stability of the fiscal framework, we have the same interest as everybody else in this Parliament in making sure that it is robust and stable and we'll see the Scottish Parliament as well as the UK Parliament able to make sensible decisions moving forward um, for the good of the people that you represent. Now, there, we all know Again, there are huge challenges in doing that, but I think it's very important that it, that it can be done in a way which has that longer-term view in sight and which picks up the Smith Commission's recommendation about strong intergovernmental mechanisms as a basis for doing it properly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's important that we read all of it in, in, in conjunction with some of the other recommendations that were there around that because, I mean, I suppose I'm just interested in whether or not, uh, and I don't expect you to predict the future of your own um, work here in... in an environment that's kind of difficult um, uh, to predict, but you, in theory, you, you could imagine circumstances where you might be commenting in the future on whether or not an amount of money that was earmarked for something was um, uh, correct. Uh, to, I mean, that's a bit of a valued, uh, latent term, but um, making a judgment about the actual amounts that were transferred. Uh, or, or do you think that's likely? It might be helpful if we use the Scottish rate of income tax um, as, as an example here, the best one that we've the, the furthest worked through um, that we have. We are in the position now where there is an agreement in progress between the UK government, the Scottish government and HMRC about how that will be done. Um, in future, the Scottish Fiscal Commission will be commenting on the forecasts for the Scottish rate of income tax proceeds in the same way that, as the OBR <coughs> is. Our formal interest will start at the point where that sum of money is transferred from H HMRC into the Scottish Government's Consolidated Fund bank account. Um, and um, we will be uh, auditing that in the Scottish Government's financial statements, whatever form they take at that stage. The memorandum of understanding that you've got in front of you in draft today is attempting to move a bit further than that in saying, of course, the Scottish Parliament also has an interest in making sure that the amount that is transferred properly reflects the amount collected from Scottish taxpayers under the agreement that's been made. HMRC is a UK body that's audited by the National Audit Office and will continue to be so, but we're agreeing a mechanism by which they will discuss with us their audit work insofar as it relates to the Scottish rate of income tax proceeds, and we will have a power to um, comment on their reports to this committee and to the Parliament if we think there are issues that need to be drawn to your attention. 
Now, I think that model provides a model that can be extended to other sources of income or expenditure that are administered by UK bodies on behalf of the Scottish Parliament. And there will also be new taxes uh, to be raised here in Scotland, like air passenger duty and the aggregates levy, where the, the focus will be much more clearly on what's done by the Scottish Government, where we'll have a direct audit relationship. So we're looking at a more nuanced um, landscape and, and set of arrangements in future. Um, and I think it's really helpful to have the chance to talk to you now about what your priorities are and where are the areas of interest or of uncertainty that you will need assurance on in future. Um, I mean, at, at the beginning we had the, uh, the, the example the BBC used um, and that is um, an interesting one because, I mean, as, as a Scottish licence fee payer, um, I'm interested in what the BBC does in Scotland and in Scottish output and I'm also interested in what the BBC does in terms of reporting um, on Scotland elsewhere in the UK, but that's probably, um, if, to be frank, a minority of my interest in, in terms of as a licence fee payer of the overall output of the BBC. Um, so, it, you know, it, it would be difficult to see how you could audit that um, separately if, if we were going down the route that, that uh, BBC Scotland presumably, um, you know, would lay accounts besides uh, whatever report it would make to the Scottish Parliament, because I would assume that what you know would be an opportunity for for scrutiny of their work and for a degree of influence over um, their forward priorities rather than, than really an accounting mechanism. Is that fair enough? I think actually that's a, that's a good way of framing the question. Um, there clearly is an interest of this Parliament in the BBC's activities as far as they relate to Scotland specifically, and there's a, there's a debate to be had about how that operates. Um, it would be possible, I, I guess, to take the current um, BBC Scotland management review and develop it further to provide you with more information about both performance and the amount spent in delivering its Scottish outputs. Um, but the, the BBC will continue to be, under the, the um, current direction of travel, a UK-wide institution which will report on a UK-wide level and have its accounts audited currently by KPMG with the ability for the UK Public Accounts Committee to have some oversight of that. Now, if you want to develop arrangements here, then that's something I think that would need to be negotiated with the BBC and with the UK government. Under Smith, there is a, a mechanism for, for the annual report and accounts to be laid. The question of how that might develop to give you the information that you need and what your purpose in doing it is, I think, is, is the area that's not yet been worked through. I just ask one uh, final thing, convener, and uh, well, I'll be checking to two related things in one question, hopefully. But um, if uh, it, I, I mean, you, do you believe that there, there's likely to be any need for legislative change in terms of your relationship uh, with other bodies, obviously National Audit Office and some of these other bodies which, which might be important to the Parliament? Are you confident that that can just be dealt with in terms of partnership and some of the stuff that's in uh, Memorandum of Understanding? And the other one is uh, really just an opportunity if, for you to say what you regard the biggest, um, take Nigel Dawn's point about the use of the word risk, but what the biggest risks are uh, from your point of view as an audit organisation on the transfer uh, of the powers that we're talking about here. On the first question about um, legislation, I think that the answer, honestly, is it depends. Um, for something like DWP, if, the, if DWP were to continue to deliver some of the Scottish Government's new responsibilities for welfare, then I think it would be very useful to have some of the arrangements around that enshrined in legislation, as we already have around the Scottish rate of income tax with the um, requirements both for HMRC and for the NAO to report into the Scottish Parliament. That's one parallel, but I can see circumstances where it would be very useful to have it in legislation. Other things, I think there would be no need for it. It would either be too small in scale or your interest would actually not be in the accounts. They might be in something else. Um, the second question about the, the biggest um, areas of uncertainty that need to be dealt with, I think as we were discussing in relation to the earlier um, agenda item, that question of the new volatility, the new uncertainties that come with raising revenue um, and with welfare spending, both of which vary with the conditions in the economy more widely, is something that nobody in Scotland has really had to do before. Um, and it's why we think that the um, availability of more comprehensive and transparent information is a key way of helping to manage those uncertainties. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to then go back, dear, I said to no detriment. Um, mm. Given there's no international uh, uh, illustration or um, definition of no detriment, do you think it's fair to say that ultimately the rules that will govern that can only be laid down by the fiscal agreement that will have to exist between the UK and Scottish governments? Um, 
I, I think that that fiscal agreement has to be the starting point, and I think um, there will then be, as we've discussed, technical and political challenges in the way that operates. I don't think that's entirely <coughs> uncharted territory. I know, though, I know we talk about the Barnett formula, but I think within the Barnett formula there are also areas which are um, the the result of uh, different levels of discussion and negotiation, and the same is true for other strands of funding that come in here. This is on a different scale, but it's not entirely a new thing that we've had to deal with since 1999 when the Scottish Parliament was established. Yeah, I, I think that's, I agree with that. Um, and do you think it would be helpful if we considered, rather than considering no detriment in the context of any particular tax change, you highlighted air passenger duty, that changes uh, on a particular date, but ra that rather it's considered in the context of a cycle of, of uh, a fiscal cycle, so a three-year fiscal cycle or whatever the agreed definition of that fiscal cycle might be? I'm not sure I'd agree it's an either-or choice, but I would absolutely agree that we need to be thinking about it both at the level of the individual policy measures and in relation to the big picture, um, not least because we know that some of the policy measures may interact with each other um, and that therefore you, it may not make sense to look at them each in isolation in coming up with the overall answer, um, if, if I can put it in inverted commas, to the way in which no detriment is um, protected. Some of the evidence that another committee that Stuart McMillan and I serve on has have been uh, playing around with this for a while. Uh, and the evidence there suggests that if you consider it over, the, over a cycle, again, that has to be agreed between governments, and this involves Cardiff and Belfast as well, um, the, then that's potentially going to be better for both uh, the reasons you've given, but also for audit purposes as well. So it just strikes me that considering it tax to tax is a nightmare, both politically and in every other sense, whereas in audit terms, considering it over some kind of cycle might be a better way to achieve what's being sought after, But if I understand the principle correctly. I, I think I would come back to my early answer, earlier answer that I, I do think you need both. I think you need measure-by-measure measure agreements that come up to a, to a picture for the whole package, and it clearly makes sense to keep the big picture in mind over time as well as w as it comes together more generally. No, no, fine. And... Underpinning it, therefore, um, given your earlier answer, Auditor General, on the importance of the independence of the Fiscal Commission, do you think there would be a logical role for, for that independent body, in conjunction with the OBR, to underpin the analysis, which would then help governments come to a decision not to argue about the numbers so much, because we probably always will, but instead to uh, agree or not agree that here is the dividing point and we need to come to a political agreement, because that's what it will be, on this particular scenario or that particular scenario? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very clear that the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission will need to work closely together on these issues in exactly the same way as Audit Scotland and the National Audit Office need to. What we don't want is huge amounts of duplication going on in our respective roles, but we do need to respect the fact that the UK Parliament have a set of interests and the Scottish Parliament have another, which will overlap in many cases, but which won't be the same. And you both need that the source of assurance in the case of the OBR and the Fiscal Commission about forecasts and um, the adjustments made to government funding streams in our case around the results coming out of that on an annual basis through the financial statements. That's helpful, thank you. And can I finally ask, Convener, um, do you think that um, the consolidated accounts, the whole Scotland accounts that we discussed earlier this morning, are important in this context or don't necessarily play a particularly significant role in how we'd consider Parliament best scrutinises the whole no detriment principle? I think, I think they're, they're a very important building block. They're not the whole answer, but I think, um, as colleagues earlier were describing to you, having a set of financial statements for, the Scotland, for Scotland's public um, finances as a whole, which are prepared on the basis of international financial reporting standards, so we all know the assumptions and the conventions that underlie them, that are audited in ways that give you assurance independently that they say what they purport to say, is a really strong contribution both to your scrutiny as the Parliament and the Fiscal Commission's ability to do that long-term financial sustainability job. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, convener. Um, so the first question, that it's probably out with the area uh, of Audit Scotland, but I'm going to pose a question in the list just so I can, uh, so I can actually uh, can reconcile myself with actually uh, what the answer is. Um, so in terms of the, the intergovernmental relations that takes place at the moment and uh, and certainly going forward with, uh, with further powers to come to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, are you aware of all the different mechanisms that are, that are currently, in, uh, that are currently in place, and uh, are you uh, content in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the information transfer that actually takes place 
uh, within these uh, IGR? Well, we could put our hands on our hearts and say we're aware of all the mechanisms that are in place. Um, we're not. We're very deliberately not part of government. We're independent of it. We understand the parts which um, affect the areas that we have a direct professional interest in, and we fully um, respect the Smith Commission recommendation that those intergovernmental mechanisms will need to evolve as the Smith Commission clauses come into effect. Sure. Uh, well, uh, following on uh, from that answer, then, uh, are there any uh, recommendations? Um, that Audit Scotland would actually uh, uh, like to put on the table just to, in terms of uh, what's actually there at the moment? Uh, I'm not sure there's very much we, we would want to add to that. Um, the, the issue that we've stayed closest to over the last 18 months or so for good reason has been the negotiations about the Scottish rate of income tax because they have a very direct um, impact starting next April on Scotland's public finances. Um, from our perspective um, and from what we've seen here in this committee, that has focused on the right issues and good progress is being made. Um, but we're not, we're not party to the wider set of intergovernment relationships that cover all of the other policy and political questions that need to be managed. Okay, thank you. Um, earlier on, uh, Mark Taylor, in, in his uh, contribution, um, he said that information be made available uh, uh, it should happen at uh, uh, the uh, an earliest possible uh, timescale, and, and decision makers uh, they should know uh, and have accurate uh, information. They should know how accurate that information is. Uh, and bearing in mind also the question I posed in the, in the previous session. Um, regarding uh, the, the UK budget process and the Scottish Government's uh, process. Um, uh, and certainly from an, an, a, an a different committee, um, Professor David Heald, in written evidence to the Finance Committee, um, uh, this was on the 25th of June 2014, uh, he actually stressed <coughs> that for more taxes to be devolved it would require the UK-wide change. For example, the UK Government budgetary timetable would require <coughs> change to avoid gaming. Uh, and also, I mean, as Tabby Scott said, I mean, also some of these issues have come up in, in a different committee. Um, do you think that that's actually? Um, do you think that that if the, do you think Professor Heald's comments uh, and submission is actually a valid point? So that uh, when it comes to the, the, the intergovernmental relations, when it comes to the information sharing, uh, and the accurate or the accuracy of the information for the decision makers, do you think that uh, that actually would be a beneficial thing, particularly for the devolution of further powers? I think I'd probably go back to um, Lord Smith's very clear recommendation that the fiscal framework needs to be updated to take account of all of this. Um, from our perspective, the fiscal framework <coughs> includes financial reporting, which is what we've been majoring on for obvious reasons, but it also picks up the budget and scrutiny cycle, the fiscal rules that will need to be agreed, um, and the other elements. I think all of that needs to be reviewed. Our focus has been very much on financial reporting because that's where our professional expertise lied. Um, but I can... Uh, only agree wholeheartedly with Lord Smith's conclusion that that whole picture will need to be developed over the next couple of years as the Smith clauses come into being. Uh, and one final question, if I may convene. Um, <laughs> I know certainly I mean, uh, I mean, all the parties, all the major parties in Scotland also have signed up uh, to Smith. Uh, and, and I'm not asking, my question is not about asking you for a policy uh, uh, suggestion. Um, but in terms of the further powers that are going to come uh, to the Scottish Parliament, um, uh, does Audit Scotland actually have a view in terms of any other organisations that potentially uh, could have uh, an impact uh, or could uh, actually have uh, uh, a regular dialogue uh, with uh, the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Parliamentary mm -hmm. Committees? Uh, and I'm thinking of you know, one in particular, likes of the Bank of England, because of the borrowing powers that the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament is going to have. I think um, sticking with our interest, which is in providing this committee and this parliament with assurance about the way in which public money is spent, the key bodies will be HMRC with the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, VAT, um, which will be continue to be collected um, by a UK-wide body, and depending on the policy decisions taken about the way the new welfare responsibilities work, DWP, if they continue to play a major role, that will be particularly important, but universal credit means that there will be a, a read across anyway. 
Um, beyond that, I think it goes back to the opening questions from the convener. It depends very much on what your interest is. Um, I wouldn't at this stage expect the Bank of England to be a particularly um, high priority on that list. Um, the borrowing powers that are coming through the Scotland Act at the moment are, are relatively limited. That's not to say they're unimportant and don't need to be managed well, but they are limited. Um, the extent to which further borrowing powers will be devolved um, is still something that will need to work through the legislative process. Um, so that relationship may change, but I think it comes back to clarity about the purpose, and you can then work out which bodies need to be involved and what the relationship put should be from there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Me too. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to just build a little bit on the sort of risk management side. Obviously, there's new risks coming on board with the new powers. There's a risk to public spending if the revenues uh, from the devolved taxation come in under forecast. There's risks about uh, demand-led welfare powers. To what extent can Audit Scotland audit and report on the risk to Scottish public finances arising from the proposed new powers in the areas such as taxation, borrowing and the welfare provisions? I don't think we would be particularly reporting on the risks from those areas of policy themselves. Um, I think that's something that we would expect the work, the audit work that we produce to be informing the Scottish Fiscal Commission's reporting around. Um, we can, though, I think, expect to be playing a role, particularly over the transitional period, of the way in which the new powers are being implemented and the readiness for them. Um, you may recall we reported at the back end of last year on preparations for the Scotland Act, which gave a good deal of assurance about about um, the preparations that were in hand and also um, raised some questions about the speed of implementing IT systems. That's a good example of our sort of oversight of the preparations that are happening during the transitional period, which is, I guess, when the risks are likely to be the highest. Now, the command paper actually states that the fiscal rules will need to be agreed by both the Scottish and UK governments. What is your role in monitoring adherence to the fiscal rules? Um, I'm not expecting it to be a significant part of my work or that of Audit Scotland in the same way that it currently isn't for the Comptroller and Auditor General and the, a the NAO in the UK. The OBR plays that role on a UK basis, as I said, drawing on some of the information that comes out of the Audited Accounts of Government, um, and I would expect a parallel situation to develop here in Scotland. We would expect to have a close relationship with the Fiscal Commission, and I think that's already developing very well from our perspective, so that we understand our work programmes um, and can explore areas of uncertainty or um, sort of working papers behind the scenes. But I think the two sets of responsibilities are, are pretty clearly demarcated. I mean, obviously, the Fiscal Commission is going to have a, a clear role in the forecasting element of tax and spending decisions. What do you see as the priorities for ensuring that there's an effective and independent Scottish Fiscal Commission? I think the government has done um, a very good job in establishing the Scottish Fiscal Commission early um, from, so that it was in place in good time to comment on the first Scottish tax forecasts on land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax. Um, I'm aware, as you will be, that the, the Deputy First Minister has produced a consultation paper in the last week or so uh, with proposals for putting the Fiscal Commission on a statutory basis moving forward as its role um, expands to cover the Scottish rate of income tax and then the Smith proposals after that. Um, and that includes some questions around making sure it's on uh, the strongest footing it can be to do it. Um, we'll cer certainly be responding to that in terms of fine-tuning, but I think, as we said earlier, from our point of view, the, ch the challenge, what's most important, is to make sure, first of all, that it's got the capacity and the expertise to do what it will need to do in future, and then to make sure that its independence, its uh, non-partisanship, and its transparency place it beyond question in a very political environment. Okay, uh, can I behalf the committee thank the Auditor General team for the contribution uh, and I'm going to move the committee into private session until uh, we move to the next items which will be held in private.